uh, as always, I think it's great to have some music right before you preach because it's calming. Mostly for me. I don't know about y'all, but it is for me. I don't know about you guys, but in the mornings, in the wee hours of the mornings, I do probably some of my best thinking. And uh, I'm an inquisitive person. I always have been. And uh, one of the things I like to do is I'll look at something or I'll be thinking about something and I want to figure out why it has purpose. Why does it exist? What in the world? How did this come about? And so I spend a lot of downtime sometimes trying to trace that out and find things out because I find that if you can understand why something exists, you typically can understand how it was created. And in some instances, in most instances, you keep going back, you will also discover who made it. Sometimes it was one person, sometimes it's a collaboration. Uh, for example, the piano. You know, we look back at the piano and think, how did that come about? It is a very intricate piece of equipment, musical equipment. There's lots of strings, um, and there's the keys that make the sounds work. But at some point, somebody had a string, somebody had a wire, and it was made of a nice sound. And then they put another one and another one together and made a chord. And then they put enough together and they made an octave. And eventually they came up with, we put this thing together, have all these octaves, 88 keys, we can make music and cover our spectrum of sounds. And so we find things out by being inquisitive. Uh, one of the things that I have been thinking about the last few months is church. Have you ever, I mean, we come to church, most of us have been coming to church for a long time. Uh, some of us are new to this. But have you considered why church? And that's the title. Why do we do this thing? Have you ever just thought about it? How does it come about? How did it form? Who made it? Okay, the answer is on the back of your bulletin. Who made it? We know. I gave you that one for free. That's uh, You're not going to fail the test. But who made it? God did. But why? What's the purpose? Is it? It's not a building. It's a little bit interesting about how that all came about. So uh, I want to try and answer these questions all pretty much at the same time. And uh, I want to go way back. I want to like to... Those of you who heard me and know me, I like to start in the Old Testament and roll forward to the New Testament um, because there's a lot to cover in between there. But let's go back to uh, Genesis 2, 19 and 24. And we're going to see the first institution of what the church is, what what a definition is. It says, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. At this time, Adam had been brought and God had already made the earth and he'd made the sun and the moon and he had the... He was out there taking care of the animals. God brought the animals to him. And uh, it says he caused... Okay, we got it up there now. So God caused man to fall asleep. And uh, while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed him up and placed with the flesh. And then it says, And then the Lord made a woman from the rib and taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. This was, I mentioned a while ago, institution. Um, This is the first institution, if you will, the beginnings of the church. Um, And let me stop for a minute. If you're following along in your Bible, this is something that I didn't catch, believe it or not, until a few weeks ago. Uh, We're talking, in the first part of Genesis, we got the whole creation account. We got everything from the stars, the sun, the moon, the birds, the whales, grass, animals, Adam. But is Eve, is, am I right in thinking that in my Bible that Eve is the last creation instance we have? It's the last thing? There's nothing else after that. In this, I mean, God's still in the miracle business, but this is the last thing He created. And if that's true, then I guess He saved the best for last. Would you agree? Some might say... Well, maybe he just needed a little bit more time to figure out woman, and it took him a little bit more time, and that's why she was last. You know, I don't purport whichever one, but I'm going to go with the first one since I'm married. And, and I believe that woman was probably the, the crowning achievement, and there was a reason. God always has a reason. Well, let me stop for just a minute and say this too. Um, going back to Adam and Eve, when he made Eve... He gave, it said, there was a clue there in the the Scripture. It says that, you know, uh, God would bring the animals to man and He would name them, but no suitable helper was found for for man. And God says, well, I'm going to make a helper. Let me just say, I'm not going to go chase a a rabbit here, but 
a woman is the best helper a man can have in life, and a man is the best helper that a woman can have. God gives you what you need, when you need it, always right on time. Amen? Amen? All right. So, he was the last creation. It's, um, Adam was doing what he was supposed to be doing, but there was no traction. Let me just say that God, until Eve came on the scene, Adam was just tilling and, I don't know, naming animals. But when Eve came on the scene, things started happening. Okay, Eve had to be there to fill the mission that God wanted for His church. Without Eve, we don't, we don't exist. Okay, Eve becomes the mother of all of mankind. Consequently, Adam, the father of all mankind. So Eve had a purpose. She was the bridesmaid, the wife of Adam. First institution, marriage. This is how the church is beginning right here. We don't hear the word church yet. Consequently, we don't even hear the word church as a building or a place until about between the second and third century. The, the word church that we, you read about in the New Testament, it's not talking about a building ever. I'm just a reporter. I didn't write it. But check it out. It's always the church is a body. It's you and me. It's a, we're believers together. And we're like a body of believers. Okay, that's what the church is. It's interesting enough, the New Testament church fulfilled all the things that it wanted to fulfill that God wanted to, and they didn't have a Bible. You know, Jason was talking about, you know, prior to, if you realize when the New Testament church started, the people started becoming believers. They didn't have what we have, and yet they knew what they were supposed to do. I'm jumping ahead. Um, so uh, let's fast forward to when Jesus Christ comes on the scene. I think this is uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 1547. And it says, we get an idea, something that you may have heard before, that, uh, uh, that Jesus is the second Adam. And here's a reference to it. It says, the first man was the dust of the earth, and the second man was of heaven. And many times Jesus is referred to as the second Adam back here. Well, there's some parallels with Adam and Eve. It's the same with Jesus Christ. Jesus has a bride. He came back as well. He came back for his bride. He died for his bride. He didn't die for a building. He didn't die for something that's inanimate. It doesn't have life. He died for something that's real. He died for us. And this is the answer. We are the church. We are the bride of Christ. And that I will purport to you that Adam and Eve, Adam couldn't finish his job. He couldn't fulfill his mission without Eve. Jesus can't fulfill his mission without his church, without his bride of Christ either. We have a part to play. And that should inspire in all us that we have that kind of responsibility to further His kingdom. Just as Eve furthered the, the human kingdom here, we are to, as the bride of Jesus, to further the heavenly kingdom here on earth. Um, take a look at Genesis 1.27. This is interesting because there's parallels again that I like to, that I find that I want to throw out to you. In the Old Testament, the first book of the Bible, we see in Genesis 1.27, it's the account of creation. It's the first account. God created mankind in His own image. In the image of God, He created them male and female, and He created them. Now, that's the first page, the first book of the Old Testament. Jesus, fast forward, does the same thing in the first book of the New Testament, in the first book, Matthew. What does it say in Matthew 16, uh, verse 18? And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will, will not overcome it. This is Christ talking to Peter, and I'm going to pull this back in in a minute. But there are parallels from the Old Testament to the New Testament right there. There's no mistakes about this. Um, so we kind of start to understand what the church is. We are the bride of Christ. Who is the church? We are. You are. Every man, woman, and child. And so we understand what we are. We understand who made us, God. And we kind of want to look at, just as Eve had a mission, we have a mission, the bride of Christ as well. What is that mission? Okay. So how do we best perform our mission? Remember then the beginning that I asked you a question about inventions and why things are created. I said the piano, and we look back at things. What about light? Light. Um, in general, you know, before we had sun, we had moon. And when the sun went down, before we had fire, before we had any light, we went to sleep. 
But we, as men, we fear the darkness. We don't like the dark. Okay? So God, I mean, we started to create light, finding ways, fire, different things, the light bulb. Um, men, we don't like to be in the dark. Okay? I, for one, think that we probably slept too long back then anyways. Because when the sun goes down, there's nothing to do if you don't have light. I, for one, as the older I get, don't need that much sleep. I only need about you know, eight or ten hours of sleep, like six, <laughs> something like that. Depends on what day it is. After today, it may be like 12. Um, but we created light. Now, I want to take this back to Genesis again and go with this thing about light. Stay with me. So in Genesis 1, 16, verse 19, um, it says, God made two great lights, the greater light to be governed of the day and the lesser light to be the government of the night. And he also made the stars. There's a lesson here, and I want to steal this back because um, all through time, since there's been sun and there's been moon, there have been people and cults and there have been religions that have taken and twisted this. And we've heard that you know the sun is like a, a masculine and that the moon is feminine. And there's been worship of one or the other, or both, or all the in-between. Now, I want to steal that back because God created these things in the first page. He created these things, and there's lessons to be learned about this. Let me say, I don't have a problem with the sun being masculine. I don't have a problem with the moon being feminine, because there's something to be learned here. What does the moon do that nothing else can do? Okay, the sun comes up and you see the moon. The moon does what? It does one thing and only. It doesn't have any inner illumination abilities. It has no fire. No, it's not a star. It's a ball of dust. And what does it do? It reflects, right? Some of you students are out there going, I didn't want science today. I came to church. Okay, seriously. All the moon does is reflect the sun. Are you staying with me? Are you tracking with me? That's what we the church are supposed to be doing. We, I don't have a problem with the, with, with the church being moon because we're supposed to keep our eye on the sun. We're supposed to reflect the sun. When people come in our church, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Reflect what God is. And He tells us what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to love people, show mercy, help people. That's how we stay in tune and we reflect what the sun is, the S-O-N. But you know, things, it's hard. It, we're not perfect every day. We can't pull this off every day. By the way, let me go a little personal. You know, every man, woman, and child, when we leave this building that we call a church, and we, the body of believers, go outside, and we become the church individually, man, woman, child, student, we're supposed to be still reflecting the sun to those people that were around us at work, at play. Okay? Um, in, in hopes that in some point in your life, people watch you. I know they do. And they look for consistencies. I see that with the students. I see that when I work with young people. They look for consistencies because there's a lot of things that are not consistent in the world. And people look at you for consistencies. If you have a great affect, you like and you're happy, and people say, man, nothing gets him down. Nothing gets her down. They're unflappable. I hope and pray that when somebody, the Holy Spirit pricks somebody to come and talk to you about what is it? What is it that you have? Why are you consistent? Why is it? Never seems to be nothing bothers you. That you can humbly have a testimony and say, I'm just trying to reflect the sun. I'm just trying to reflect what Christ has done for me. I'm, I'm just a humble servant. And whatever you see good in me, whatever you think you see, it's just a reflection of God who came and saved me. So, there's a, you know, I so said it's hard for us to do this every day, in and out, in and out. That's because we're human. That's because we're not perfect. We're not even half God like Christ was. And Jesus knows this. God knows this. Every day. We're not, we just can't pull it off and be perfect every day. And God knows this. You know, there's a verse in the Bible, and this one I didn't look up, but I've, I heard it so much in my life, that Jesus' mercies start fresh and anew every morning. It's like the sun coming up. You didn't do great the day before, but today is a new day. When you wake up, God's giving you a new opportunity to reflect Him, to love on people. But there's something that gets in the way... Here it comes back to cosmology again. Cosmology, cosmology. And that is what gets in the way of the moon and the sun. When the, when the moon can't reflect the sun, what's in the way? The world? Yeah, it's the world. The world gets in the way. That's how can we have phases and shifts in the moon. And it gets in the way. And you can't reflect the sun. It's the same way in our lives. 
When you go outside, the world gets in the way sometimes of you being able to reflect God's love and what He's done for you. It's hard to reflect what you can't see. And as a church, we can't, let me just say this, stop for a second, we can't let the world inside. This is not a place for the world. This is a place that we reflect God in the sun. And we need to try our best to do that every day. Not perfect. Understand that. Um, moving right along. So also, all through the Bible, if you picked up on this, that Jesus is always referred to as the Son of Light. He's always the Lord of the Light. And Satan is always referred to as darkness. He's the King of Darkness. That is throughout the Bible. That is a theme. So there's, there's these things that God, I believe, is trying to teach us through nature. It's, you go outside, go in the mountains sometimes, and get away and, just, and get undistracted, and you can see the glory in God. He is surrounding us. Um, just as the moon reflects the sun, and, and, and these things in our lives, we're supposed to reflect God as well. Um, Back when I was talking about in Matthew, Jesus came and told Peter, upon this rock I'm going to build my church. Let's flash forward a little bit to where Jesus comes back. Jesus has come. He has died. And again, remember, He has died for a living thing. He has died for this institution, His bride. He takes the time to come back to Peter, who He told earlier on in Matthew, I'm going to build my church upon you. He comes back and says, he catches and finds him and says, Peter, now, G, now Peter has denied him three times. He comes back and says, Peter, do you love me? And, Jesus, and Peter says, yes, I do. And he says what? Feed my sheep. He says it again, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. Third time, Peter, do you love me? And I know at that point, I'm sure Peter went, Three times. And he says something a little different. He says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus says the same thing for the third time. Then feed my sheep. This, I will propose to you, is our mission statement. We are to love all people. And he is reaffirming, Peter, I'm going to build my church on you. You are reaffirmed. Um, I think I needed to stop here just a second. Um, I wanted to make sure you guys get the bulletins that we have here because we're going to do these all at the same time. The first one that you have in your... I know you don't like to go home with blanks on your, on your bulletin. But uh, what is a church? It is a living institution. And I gave you two scriptures there. And then the second one, um, what is a church? It's a bride of Christ. And then the last one is there for it's, it's you and I individually and all believers as a group. And I try to give extra scripture because one of the things I learned early on is that um, not that you shouldn't trust me, but I want to give you scripture verses to go and look at and go deeper. Okay? Um, always try to give extra scripture verses because I want you guys to go deeper and find things out. And if you find something wrong, then I have no problem with you coming and contesting that because, again... I'm just the reporter. I didn't write this. But I'm doing my best to bring it forward to you. Um, so just as the bride of Christ okay, has a mission to fulfill, so do we the living bride of Christ. Christ has chosen this method from the beginning of time to accomplish His mission. He gave us our church. And he's given us our mission statement, which is love one another. Uh, this is found in John 13, 34. You don't have it here. But Jesus is telling His disciples, love one another. And if you love one another, all men will know who you are. You will know my, that you are my disciples by if you love one another. He gave us then our marching, our marching orders right before He ascended into heaven. And this is in Matthew 28, 18. I think we'll have that one. Matthew 28, 18 and 20. He says, Jesus then came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Uh, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Jason used this one just a while ago in his slideshow. That's, that's marching orders. 
Also, we have in Acts, one more verse, Acts. This is the, also another account of Jesus ascending right there, first chapter of Acts, number one. It says, but you, Jesus is saying right before he goes into heaven, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses into Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Let me translate that for you real quick, what it is. That means that we're supposed to start with our family, and then we're supposed to start with our neighbors, and then we're supposed to start with Glen Rose and Somerville County and Texas and the U.S. and the world. And that's Jason's in that seventh one. Okay, He's in Ghana. And that's where God has placed him. God has placed all of us with your family. He's placed all of us with neighbors. And He's placed all of us in Glen Rose. You, the church, just like Eve, has a mission to do. As the bride of Christ, we, this is the way God has chosen to make His kingdom grow here on earth. Again, that's his, the way He's chosen to do it. Christ, again, when He came, He didn't come for a building. He came for us individually. He came for us as a people. Um, make no mistake about it. <clears throat> Christ is coming back. We sang about it in the last two songs. Beautiful. Christ. You see the picture of the cross. Christ is coming back. There is a timeline to this. There is, it's, it's actually time sensitive, if you will. I don't know the time that Christ comes back. No one does. But it says, the Bible is not a book of lies. It continually perpetuates truth. And Jesus is coming back. It is said, is prophesied, and is written over and over again. If we look a little bit of... Uh, let's go all the way to Revelation, the last book in the Bible. Um, in 19.7... It says, let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory, Christ, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. That is in reference to us. This is when Jesus comes back. There is going to be a wedding. There is going to be a reunion between our groom, our husband, as the church, which is Jesus Christ. And this is going to be lasting forever. It will be like nothing else. We, we, can't, we can only try to imagine. But there is prophecies. This is what's going to We have to work toward this goal. We have to be ever vigilant. Christ is coming back. Um, and when He comes back, it's time, I hate to say, is up. So let's stop and do the last slides here, of the last part. That says, what is the church's purpose? First and foremost, the church's purpose is to love Him. You can't reflect something you don't love. You just can't. If you can't see Him and you don't know Him, you're not going to reflect it. Um, so we have to love Him, to reflect Him. And the third one is to love one another. That's sometimes the hardest one, to love one another. Um, and lastly, was what Christ gave us our marching orders, what we just talked about, is to witness to the world. Um, you know, today is a beautiful day. Um, it's like Sunday that we have, that we're kind of used to. But the last two Sundays have been different. You know, last week it was just raining. Of course, it's rained every day. It's great. I don't mind rain. Although I was telling somebody, I don't think Texans are made to have more than two or three days of rain. We start getting depressed. Uh, it's just the way it is. We're used to sunshine and used to weird weather changing every, you know, every day, every hour sometimes. Um, but the two Sundays ago, if you were here, you remember between the services, at the end of the first service, it started sleeting. It was kind of loud. It was up on top. And uh, it was really loud. And then you know, we had our Sunday school time. We came, back, we came back out. And I was standing outside with our ushers and our policemen. And uh, it was just white. It was still kind of coming down. And Brother Rick was getting started in here. And Kent was doing the music. And I was standing out there with John and, and our police officer. And uh, we were looking across um, Texas... Is it Texas Tractor Supply? Yeah, tractor, I call it Tractor Supply. And you know, they built, we were watching it being built, but we were watching, there's this fence that they built, wooden fence. And because it was white, you could see something. I was like, what is that? It looks like it's a deer. And they're like, oh yeah, there's a couple deer and they're running back and forth across that fence. And the police officer said, yeah, they're confused. They don't know what to do because there wasn't a fence there and there used to be forest and they're used to going through there and now it's just... If they're, they, they're in there and they can't seem to get out, figure it out. And then the police officer said, he goes, well, they'll figure it out. And then John, as John says, he goes, are not. 
Meaning they'll die, I guess. It's just when John doesn't speak much, but when he does, it's like, or not. I like, and I thought, you know, that kind of will preach, and i got to preach in a couple weeks. And then I thought, yeah, there is a story there, but it reminded me then as I was driving home of a better story um, about a farmer who was out in Kansas. And from what I understand, this is supposed to be a true story. He was in Kansas, lived his life out there, and you know in Kansas there's no trees, and it's flat, and you can see for hundreds of miles. I've been there a couple times uh, by mistake. That's another story. Um, and he could see a storm coming. And so he's like, oh, man, it's one of those blue northers going to be bad. So he's putting his cows in, getting his horses in, getting everything in the barn and getting everything safe. Went in to tell his wife, hey, honey, there's a storm coming. I like to say, batten down the hatches, make sure the windows are down and let's get everything ready. And so he's got everything ready. And he's standing outside on the porch. He's watching the storm getting ready to come. And he's watching these birds. These birds are circling. The birds are circling. And they just, he's like, that's weird. I don't know why these birds are here, but they're obviously upset. They're frightened of the storm. I don't, there's no place to go. I'm going to open my barn up. So that's why we have a picture of a barn. So he goes out and opens his barn and says, you know, maybe they'll fly in there and they'll be safe. And so he goes out there, does that, comes back and stands there. He's got one eye on the storm. He's watching these birds. They're circling the barn, but they won't go in. And he's like, oh, man. Okay, I will go open the other end of the barn up. I'll open the other door because maybe they need to see so they can fly through and they can see how to, where they're in. It's maybe dark what they do. So he goes and opens both the, door, the, the barn all open. I'm sure the rest of the animals are going, what are you doing? But he's trying to save the birds. So he goes back, stands on the porch, and he's standing there with his wife, and the storm's getting closer. The birds are circling. They're more frantic. And he's getting frustrated because he's like, I just want to save those birds. That is stupid birds. Why won't they go in the barn? I've done everything I can. I've opened it up. That sanctuary is safe. What do I have to do to make these birds understand? And his wife said, well, you could become a bird. You could fly up there. And they both looked at each other and went, huh, that's what Jesus did. Heaven's sanctuary. Heaven's a safe place. The storm is coming. This whole thing from Adam and Eve to Christ to in Revelation, the end, I said it's time sensitive. It is. Christ is coming back. Make no mistake about it. And that's what He did. He came to us. He became like us so He could show us the way. And we don't have to wander around and be frightened of the storm. And I don't know if you've had that opportunity in your life, if this makes sense to you or it doesn't, but I want to tell you that, as I said earlier, you can't reflect something that you don't know nothing about. You can't understand something or talk about it if you don't have an expertise in it. And it starts in our lives. You, every one of us, are the church. He's going to accomplish. Christ is going to accomplish His mission through us. That's the way He set it up. He could have done it another way, but this is the way He chooses to do it. We should be excited, humbled, and in awe that God is using us, the bride of Christ, to bring more people to Him. In a minute, the musicians are going to play. And if you haven't made a decision, if, if anything resonates with you of what I've said, it's not from me, from God, then I beg you to come forward. If you've got something in your life you need to get rid of, that's what we do. You come and you get rid of There's things we need. God knows that. That's why we come together as a body of believers. If there's anger that you need to confess, if there's stuff that's bothering you, frustrations, that's what we're here. That's what this altar is about, is to pray for one another. And let me just say, if you want to come down and accept Jesus Christ, and you want me to pray for you, that's great. I am not a magician. I don't know nothing special about me. If you would rather grab somebody you know and say, will you come pray with me? Then do that. Okay, there's nothing special about me. But I want to tell you that this is an opportunity. This is why we do this at the end of each service is to offer an opportunity for God's people to respond to Him. He responds to you. But many times He's a gentleman and He waits on you to make that first step. So as I pray, I'm going to pray for you guys. And our musician is going to come up. And then let's all stand after I pray and keep our heads bowed. And let's just see if, and pray that if you want to do business with God, we're here for you. God, I come before you as just a humble, humble servant, still learning my ways, still trying to lean on you, God, for direction in my life and my family's life. 
And though I do not reflect every day what I should, there's the love of Christ in me. But God, I confess before you that I'm going to try harder every day and I'm going to do better every day. And I know that you will forgive. You forgive every person. You, your love is new and fresh every day for us. And I pray for anyone out there that, God, that is, has not, doesn't know you, that wants to know you, God, that you will just move them to come forward and pray with somebody, with me or anybody, God. This is a day that can change everything, that we can have purpose in our life, and we can understand what we're supposed to do. It's a great place to be in the kingdom of God. There is a storm coming, God. And you sent Jesus to keep us from it. Father, for anyone that's looking to join a church, there are no perfect churches, we know that. But God, we are doing our best at this church to reflect you, to be a church, the bride that you would be proud of, that you will be reunited with at the end of the age. So God, I pray, whatever it is that we have business to do, may we do it with you, and may we do it with humble hearts. It's in your name I pray these things, Christ. May you always be glorified in what this church does, inside and out, as we go out as your people, your church, each one of us. In your name I pray these things. Amen.